Yeah, I asked Pastor Bill if he would lead us in that. I was um, going through some notes. I got a folder for Good Friday service. I've been doing my prep work for Good Friday. And um, I've got notes from the very first Good Friday church I, service I led at our first church in Montgomery at McGee Road Baptist in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, I was 26 years old, and, and Faith and I were at that time only been married about a year and we it's it's neat because I've got my notes typed out and what was fun is Faith's got her handwritten notes because she would run sound that's that's the way it worked back then Faith would run sound for me and lights and I would get up front and do a little bit and we would play songs and and uh, so I had those songs written in there and I was reminded of that when we would start it off every year with that one on Good Friday but um, just fun and special as we look towards this week we come to Wednesday of um, Christ's Passion Week, his final week, and, and it's an interesting day because we don't, <clears throat> there's not a lot of recorded information as to what Jesus did on that day. The speculation, and it's all speculation because we don't know for certain, but the speculation is that Jesus used it primarily as a day of rest for him. Um, probably knowing that when he awoke um, Thursday morning, it would be the last time he had gotten any rest prior to his crucifixion. So he'll go all day Thursday, and as we'll know, he'll go all Thursday night into Friday, and, and obviously to his crucifixion on Friday around noon, or probably around 10 or 9 in the morning on Friday. But while Christ um, wasn't that engaged in much activity that we know of, um, certainly there was a lot of activity going on, specifically amongst the Jewish leadership as they were putting together their plot and their plan to kill Jesus. The scripture reference for this is Matthew 26. It's just a few verses in Matthew 26, verses 3 through 5. We also get a little bit of information in Luke 22, 1 through 2. If you want to read it in Matthew 26, 3 through 5 with me, we'll look at that. And then we'll discuss this plot that they've put together. It says in Matthew 26, verses 3 through 5, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a, a riot might occur among the people. And again, not reading it here, but in Luke 22, 1 through 2, it also tells us that the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might kill him because they feared the people. The Jews have developed an incredibly intricate plot to kill Jesus. As we've already discussed on that Palm Sunday, his popularity has increased dramatically following the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The Jewish leadership is concerned. In fact, that would have been an understatement. They know in their hearts if this uprising continues, Rome will see it as a threat to Caesar. And not only will it be a threat to Caesar, then they'll see themselves as a threat and they'll be out of a job. And ultimately, in their minds, Israel might even lose its sovereignty. In fact, Caiaphas said, it's better for one man to die than for the whole nation. Make no mistake about it, as we've talked about, this is about jealousy, this is about pride, this is about self-preservation, that this man, Jesus, is cutting in on our business. He's, he's making us look bad. And if we allow this guy to continue and his popularity continue, then we're all in trouble. And so they've come to the determination in their minds that Jesus must die. They have no real concern for the people. That They have no concern for the nation. They have no real concern for God. It's all about their own pride. It's all about their own self-preservation and it's all about maintaining their position of power and authority amongst the nation. He has to die, but they also know, as it states here, that they can't do it during the day. And so what they've done is they've found themselves an insider, one amongst the group who would betray him. And they come to him at night. All of this will be done under the cover of darkness so as to not create an uprising. And they also knew that Passover was the perfect time. Why? Because they knew during Passover at night all the people would be in their homes. They know also that they have to try Jesus twice in 24 hours. So according to Jewish law, in order to convict somebody of death, you had to try them twice with a day in between. They couldn't do these things necessarily in the light of, 
of day, and so they'll have to violate that rule. But they're going to put aside the rules in this situation to achieve what they believe is the greater good. They have a lot to accomplish. They have to pay false witnesses. Not only do they have to pay false witnesses, they got to find the false witnesses, and they got to prepare those witnesses with prepared statements, and then they got to pay the false witnesses. Not only do they have to get false witnesses, they got to get Pilate ready. Because you remember, Pilate won't kill, the Romans will not kill somebody for claiming to be God. That was no issue for them. There were a lot of people who came along from time to time claiming to be God. That was no issue to them. The real issue was the, with the Romans is that, that Jesus is pronouncing himself to be the king. And so they've got to get Jesus tried for sedition or, or treason. And in order to do that, they've got to convince Pilate that that's what Jesus is setting himself up as. They gotta do that, not only do they gotta do that, but they gotta get him on the cross by 9 a.m. Why would they wanna get him on the cross so early in the day? They wanna do it before the entire nation wakes up and realizes what has happened. They wanna get him all on the cross and get him there before the nation knows. And they want him to be crucified publicly so that once the nation awakes and they're all there and they see Jesus hanging on the cross, their idea is in their mind that once they see Jesus on the cross and they see him die, they will know that Jesus is a fraud. It's an incredibly intricate plot. I think that these guys were probably very impressed with their own wisdom and their own cleverness. What a great plot we put together. It's perfect. Everything is falling into place. We'll be able to do this under the cover of darkness. We may even get away with the whole 24-hour rule. We may have to get, get, a little, get a little clever with it, but we'll get, we'll get by. And we got these witnesses, and people have come forward, and they're willing to testify against them. The money's there, and we've got it all paid. They were probably so impressed with their clever plan. But what do we know? We know that they were playing right in to the hands of God. In fact, God is going to use the activities of these, these enemies of Christ and of God to bring about his perfect plan of salvation, a plan that was in the mind of God before the creation of the world. Why is this so important? Why is it important that we understand that what's occurring here is God's sovereign plan? It's important because it reminds us as we draw closer to the cross that Jesus is not just some guy who gets caught up in the wrong place at the wrong time. His death is not the result of the cleverness and the schemings of the Jewish leadership. His death is not the result of the wickedness of Rome. Jesus dies according to the perfect will and plan of God. Even Isaiah 700 years in advance would say there was no deceit found in his mouth, um, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. No one will take Jesus' life. He will lay it down willingly of his own initiative in submission to the perfect plan of God so that you and I, as prisoners of sin, as prisoners of Satan and of death, could have a means of freedom through faith in him. Psalm chapter 2, I Love this psalm, this messianic psalm that says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples devise a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart. Let us cast away their cords from us. And what does it say? He who sits in the heavens laughs. Do you not think, as these Jewish leaders were so impressed with their clever scheming, that God in heaven wasn't grinning just a little bit? They're playing right into my pants. All of this is occurring according to his perfect and sovereign will. You remember back the, the brothers of Joseph? Who was it, what brother was it that sold Joseph into slavery? What brother was it, anybody know? Who was it? Judah. Judah, uh, and you remember what Joseph said? He said as he brings his brothers in close, he says, you meant it for evil, but what? God meant it for good. God turned it around for the salvation of the nation. Samson, Samson was betrayed by the tribe of Judah. Remember, the Sam, uh, Samson made the Philistines mad in Judges 15. The tribe that hands, they tie Samson up 
and they hand him over to the Philistines, hoping that it will appease their anger towards them and that somehow it would save the people of Israel. Um, it's a powerful picture. So they've got Samson all tied up, and Judah knows the Philistines are mad, and they're thinking, this guy did it. He's the guy you're mad at. And so they put Samson out there as an offering, uh, hoping that it will appease the, the Philistines. And do you remember what happens? The Spirit of God falls on Samson, and, and he releases himself from the bonds that tie him, and he will take the jawbone of a donkey, and with the instrument of death, he'll defeat the enemies of death, and you remember at the end of that, as he exerts himself physically in the killing of all those Philistines, he cries out, I thirst. And the ground breaks open, water wells up from the ground, and the place of death became the place of life. It's a powerful picture. Joseph betrayed by Judah. And what did it turn out for? It turned out for the salvation of the people. Samson was betrayed by the tribe of Judah, and yet it turned out for what? for the salvation of the nation. Jesus will be betrayed by who? Judas. Sounds a little bit like Judah, doesn't it? And yet what God, what he meant for evil, God intended for good. And God will turn it around for the salvation of his people and for his glory. God can take the plots of evil men and turn it around for our salvation and for his glory. And it's one of the messages of the cross. Is this, a, is this good to remember when we find your, ourselves caught in situations among sinners and we feel like we're being done wrong? H has that ever happened to you in your life that you're being treated unfairly by sinners and you really couldn't do anything about it and you just had to rest in the sovereignty of God? It's one of the principles of the cross that, that you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, I love this, we don't operate within a closed system of cause and effect. You cannot, as a Christian, look at your circumstance and say, two plus two plus two equals six, and I need an eight, so I'm sunk. I got no hope in this. You can't say that because you have God outside of the box. And if he wants to part the Red Sea, he can part it. If he wants to take Pharaoh's firstborn, he can do it. If he wants to release the Israelites from Egyptian bondage without firing a shot and get the Egyptians to contribute to the Exodus fund, he can do that too. Why? Because God is sovereign over the circumstances of your life. And he has a wonderful way of turning around those situations that appear to be evil and turning them around for our good and his glory. I think of brothers in the Lord that have gone on to be with the Lord in the midst of horrific circumstances. Pancreatic cancer. My dear brother Dennis Fullman. And he trusted in Christ. He believed that God could heal him. But he knew no matter what, God redeems every circumstance. And what appeared to be awful and evil Make no mistake about it, God turned around for his good because we believe that after death for the believer is what? Resurrection life. Why? Because we got God outside the box. And the world thinks death is the end and that's it. And we say, no, no sir, it's not. Because we have a God outside the box who has defeated the grave and gives life eternal to those who trust in him. So as we look at this situation with the plotting and the wickedness of the Pharisees and the Jewish leadership, is God pleased with this situation? No. Is he still in complete control? You bet he is. Will he always tell us what he's doing? Will he always let us in on the plan? No, we just gotta trust him. In the dark and bleak moments of life, you trust him. Jesus, it says of him, 
for the joy set before him. For the joy set before him. He endured the cross and scorned its shame. In the bleakest moments of his life, he was trusting in a God who had a perfect plan and would turn it all around for our salvation and his glory. Can we trust him? When you don't know what he's doing, when the situation is dark and bleak, even when you can't see his hand, we trust his heart. Knowing that God is sovereign, and through the death of Jesus, there's no doubt he's good. So right here, things look pretty bleak. The circumstances are dark. The Jewish leadership is plotting to kill him. Judas, one of his very own guys, a guy who's been with him for three years, has already determined to betray him. Twelve disciples who all think that they're bold and will stay with him. Jesus knows they're all going to cut and run. And Jesus very clearly understands that the cross is before him. And yet God is sovereignly working all things together for our good and his glory. Can I just encourage you today, no matter how bleak the circumstances, no matter how dark the day, never doubt this. Never doubt that God sees you. Never doubt ever doubt that God loves you and if you ever begin are there circumstances that can cause us to get to a place where we might begin to doubt God's love oh we can get there but when we do where do we turn we look to the cross the cross is God's final word about the depth of his love for you never doubt that he sees you he's with you he loves you And never doubt that he is the one who works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 